Hello, welcome to another Geotech Hour. I'm your host, Dr. David Bray, inaugural director of the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center, joining you with a august panel of experts to have a conversation about the global impacts of democratized technologies and remote work. Clearly, we're living in an era in which things are changing around us, the way we work, the way we interact, including by video and how that video is presented to us. For example, I'm wearing these virtual sunshades, which I can now take off. I show how we can change, how we interact, how we perceive reality, and how we work together as humans. We define the democratization of technologies as the increasing accessibility and affordability of technologies, recognizing that just having the technologies may not be sufficient. There may be other things that we need to think about, including education, including norms of use, including practices that uplift communities and people around the world. So today, we're going to focus on how this is changing our world, how these trends are shaping, and where we want them to go so we can have good choices involving tech and data for the future ahead. I'd like to turn first to Chris. Chris, if you could real quick introduce yourself, and if you could share with us what you think is the biggest trend in 2020 regarding the democratization of technologies and remote work. Oh, and you're muted. There you go. But David, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I think you and your team just need to be saluted with your geotech work and the Atlantic Council more broadly because you've been pushing people outside of the traditional think tank mentality and really being about action most of all, you just couldn't be more essential for our times. I'm Christopher Schroeder. I'm now a venture capitalist. I've run a bunch of tech enterprises, but now I run a Next Billion Ventures, uh, which is a firm that's investing in innovation around the world. And for me, the, the word of today is acceleration of tech trends well in motion. I mean, for decades, we've been talking about and predicting that two thirds of humanity is gonna have access to a smart device in their pocket, which is effectively a supercomputer, really. But we've blown right through that. So we're in a period of unprecedented innovation bottom up and giant tech enterprises are being launched around the globe, not only in places like China, but in countless mini Chinas from Jakarta to Cairo to Sao Paulo, where local entrepreneurs are meeting large local and regional needs for their own terms. And it's no longer about copycats of Western enterprises, but with a new market specific understanding whose innovation is actually standing toe to toe with us. We are copying elements of TikTok. We, Uber, have lessons to learn from Grab in Southeast Asia. We, Amazon, have not been able to knock off Mercado Libre in Latin America and more. Now, this acceleration for me is twofold in its inhuman adoption of tech in their daily lives. COVID has had hundreds of millions of people buying for the first time online, paying with mobile money for the first time, supplementing their education, seeking medical attention for all at an astounding clip. And at the same time, COVID has been pushing a golden age of science and research, especially in biotech, whose ramifications are also going to touch every corner of the globe. And this acceleration is before we even talk about 5G and universal access to AI, machine learning, and more. Now, what is buried also, I think, is a potential warning, because if over a billion people have entered the global tech economy seemingly overnight, another billion or more have no access at all. And, you know, we've talked for years about the digital divide, where the efforts, I think, have been at best mixed. What we've learned in the last year is that if someone doesn't have access, it's like saying to somebody previously, sure, you could compete in the economy, you just aren't allowed to use the roads. Compounding, I think, this now, this version of it is, if we don't get it right, both individuals and countries could fall behind, possibly impossible to catch up. So these are among the things that I'm seeing in the worlds that I'm in. Very well said, Chris, and I particularly liked what you were talking about, that it is about making sure that everybody can participate. The last thing we want to say is you can participate in the global economy, but yes, exactly, you know, you're not going to be able to connect to the internet or connect to the internet at high speeds. Um, are you seeing in particular, are there particular emphases on infrastructure or, or other topics real quick as a rejoinder, Chris? What are you seeing as the particular things that are emphasis that we should start thinking about that everybody needs to have access to, to, to be involved in this digital economy that we're growing? Despite what I said before, which is that this is a bottom-up phenomenon of young entrepreneurs with access doing amazing things, the top-down matters. And the countries which are taking not only infrastructure in the, in the physical sense that we think about it and access technology, but things like open rule of law and regulation, that's really going to make a, a, a huge impact on the acceleration. I mean, people don't know this, but it's places like Indonesia and Brazil that are actually leading in regulatory efforts to do things like fintech and what have you. And so these are the kinds of ways that we need to think about it, I think, in a broader lens. Fascinating. Thank you, Chris. Well, that's a good segue now to Esther. Esther, longtime friend of the Geotech Center, first time on the Geotech Hour. Really glad to have you here. 
recognizing you may not need any, any introduction, but real quick, if you could introduce yourself and what do you think is the biggest trend that we're facing in 2020 involving these efforts? Okay, so I'm a former techie and uh, former chairman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Now I am the founder of Wellville, which is a 10 year, five community nonprofit project. All those words are carefully chosen to help US communities become healthier. And that's not just the rich people, but the poor people. So it's much more broadly. And with that as an intro, you won't be surprised I think that what we've really discovered about the democratization of technology in 2020 is pretty much how Chris ended, that it's, it's not really available to most people. And it's not, it's not just whether or not you have broadband, but do you have the education to take advantage of it? Uh, can you, it, and so the problem is not a simple fix of let's just have, yeah, let's nationalize broadband and give it to free for free to everybody. We need to, in the U.S. at least, do a better job of nationalizing our education system and hmm. delivering it more effectively. Uh, it's, in other words, you need sort of what democracy is supposed to deliver, which is equal access for everybody to have been around for 20 years so that they have also equal ability to take advantage of that access. And this past year, we've seen kind of how much Rich people indeed can engage in remote work and they can go live in you know, New Zealand if they want, or at least Palm Springs. Yeah. And poor people still need to show up at work wearing their masks, infecting their families, and so forth and so on. Uh, lots of interesting things happening. And one of them is a fundamental shift in what privacy means when everybody is potentially carrying this deadly weapon of a virus with them. Mm. Yeah. So all the, all the contact tracing stuff is fascinating, but also full of perils around surveillance and what we accept as the new normal about being watched and all the coercion that comes in there. So that's my intro. Wow. Well, I think that resonates very closely with the mission of what we're doing here at the Atlanta Council with Geotech, that it needs to be an uplift for all people, including peace and prosperity around the world. I would ask you real quick as a rejoinder, Esther, are, are, is this something where we should look to possibly nation states to help lead the way? Or is it a case where maybe they're just trying to play catch up and we need to figure out ways to uplift this on a community by community level, recognizing that we need to scale that and we need to make sure yeah. that it's all communities, not just a few um, select. It's complicated because, and this is what we're working, you know, this is one of our challenges in our five small communities. And the, the idea was to do this small and dense rather than, you know, large and completely invisible. You, you want local control, you want local agency, but pouring, so pouring things in from the center doesn't help. On the other hand, if you have a community that has a an inadequate or bankrupt school system, decrepit hospitals, yeah, somewhere they need the resources and, and creating that delicate balance of you know, don't invite them to sit at your table, help them to build their table in a way that it's their table and they own it because they built it. But somehow there, there needs to be some transfer of resources of training and you know, one of the great things that technology is going to enable is a lot more remote training. And it's, I don't think remote education is the panacea. We've, we were just talking about the, the very clever girl who created basically a bot to watch her school lessons for her. Right. <laughs> but, you know, the fact that you can reach people and, and get them certified and qualified and you can have human communication remotely is really important, but it's, if, if there was a simple answer to your question, David, we wouldn't need to have this conversation. 100%, and, and I'm reminded of the debates between the difference between explicit knowledge, which you can codify, and the more tacit knowledge, which comes through experience. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head, which is there's some things we may be able to share remotely, but some of it is gonna be creating better ways of building communities of experience even if we're not there in person. And I think that's gonna be really interesting, not just for getting us through the pandemic, 
But what about if you're trying to help, you know, between efforts halfway around the world, between, say, the United States and India or Africa or Indonesia? That's going to be a really interesting thing for the decade ahead, which is actually unplanned, but a great setup for Derry. Uh, Derry, really great to have you join us, Derry Gilbert Dancing, a uh, longtime friend of the Geotech Center. And, and you've been doing a lot in the area of both empowering individuals, employment, and AI. I was wondering if maybe you could share with what you're thinking is the biggest trend we're seeing in 2020 regarding democratization of technologies and remote work. Sure, thanks. Um, so I, I think uh, following up with what, uh, what was said before here just a minute ago, with regard to the cautions of education, the cautions of the disparity um, that shouldn't be lost on the conversation. Um, so I, I think taking that into account, one of the good things, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, video, right? Having video is great. Having access to that technology is fantastic. And, and what we've been seeing in, in expanding this is giving that access down to now into the phones, right? So that folks no longer have to use their laptops. Folks no longer have to work on, um, be tied to a physical desk so they can work physically anywhere. And, you know, taking that now to a first responders perspective or taking that now down to a farmer's perspective, that means that they don't physically also have to be tied to a desk or anything like that. They can actually work where the work needs to be done and accomplished. So we can bring some of that computing to them. We can bring some of those technologies to them through the use of the democratization of those technologies. It's increased that. Of course, we're now uh, held by the challenges of bandwidth access and, and, and enough uh, wireless access to be able to get to those remote locations. So we're facing the challenges until 5G becomes a thing where we're no longer talking about 5G and it just becomes a, a de facto standard where WiMAX is available and you have 40 gigabytes of bandwidth <laughs> on your, in your hand, um, we're still going to be challenged with the limitations of what is actually possible. Um, technology itself is there, but the, the ability to get it to the end point is where the challenges come into play. And I think that's exacerbated by everything that was previously brought up. I think combined with that is the cybersecurity aspects uh, of the entire process and being able to ensure security along the way so that just because you have more folks um, with more nodes and more abilities to get on uh, doesn't mean that uh, it's always the best thing uh, because you, you increase your, your technology um, uh, vectors of attack. So we have to start uh, thinking about more and continue to working on uh, securing the enterprise uh, for those folks. Excellent. And Derry, I, I, real quick, as a quick rejoinder, I know you're also working on efforts to try and help people sort of almost have one-stop shops to go to that link their education with trying to find employment, also allow employers to sort of see what's coming in terms of talent and possible pipelines that if they invest more in education could do an uplift. If you could real quick give us maybe a quick 20-second version of that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so one of the projects that we've taken on is trying to ensure that those who, it's not just folks in the professional settings um, where you sit at a desk, but folks uh, that Esther brought up, <laughs> you know, the folks who are sitting in the service industry, folks who are on the front lines, um, giving them a, a matching process to get them matched up to jobs that are in their local communities that they may not have known about um, to help bridge that disparity by those who are looking for jobs and those who have jobs. And after looking through this process, we've seen tons of job openings. And it's sad that there are tons of job openings that people just don't know about. Um, you know, we one for one example, somebody who is a web developer, uh, went through the process just to test it out and found that there were only two jobs available through the their local community process. However, when you looked at through the process we developed, there were hundreds of jobs available. Excellent. So it, it, it's it, it's trying to democratize and bring that uh, to the to the masses. Excellent, and 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 I recall that example that it was that that if you went through the standard process, you found two jobs and they were actually out of date. Mm -hmm. Whereas the process you're doing is you're shining a light that there's actually hundreds that are actually current. It's just a matter of connecting those that either need a little bit more education or have the education or just need to find the visibility into these roles. So, 
Uh, thank you for all that you do, Derry. Uh, would now like to turn to, to Stephanie Wander. I'm going to put on my uh, party hat because I have some good news to announce that she is joining the Geotech Center as the deputy director. We are excited to have her join. She has an impressive background that includes XPRIZE, uh, project manager at XPRIZE, a lot of great work also uh, in academia and also helping out with the DOD's efforts. Stephanie, real quick, if you could introduce yourself and what do you see as trends that are happening in this space as well? Well, thank you. I feel like you already gave me my introduction, but let me just add that I am super proud to be part of the Geotech Center and also to be on this panel of such esteemed experts. Um, so in response to this question, I first off want to agree with pretty much everything everyone has said thus far about the divide needing to access it. I want to highlight that we all need to be thinking about not just access to technology, but thinking about even the, asset, the, the very, very basics like access to power. And with restaurants and places closed, you know, making sure that people can go charge their devices is even just the minimum access point. So we want to be thinking about the entire pipe, the entire chain of access, basically. Um, I will add that I also think that this time is actually a really amazing opportunity for us to be thinking about how do we optimize remote work and build in solutions and things that help facilitate communication and that um, facilitate working together remotely and that allow us to engage and ensure that we can all be at home, at school, at work, all at the same time together, you know, functioning well, functioning optimally. Excellent. And 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 as you as you look at these trends, I know you've been doing a lot about helping um, those who do social work understand more a entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, maybe if you could real quick give us maybe a short 20, 20 to 30 second uh, version of what you've been doing in that space, that would be great. Sure. So I've been, uh, before, before the Geotech Center, I was a lecturer at USC teaching the next generation of graduate social workers about how to address grand challenges using implementable social solutions, really taking, going from the very broad to the very granular. Um, if anything, I almost feel like I learn more from them than they maybe learn from me. Um, I say that a little tongue in cheek, but what I think was really important about working with that community is really understanding all of the barriers uh, that those who are vulnerable face to, to, to even get through the door to, to various access issues. So, um, really understanding that we have to be really thinking about how are we rising the tide for everyone when it comes to tech access, when it comes to access to education, um, and all these important issues that really touch on technology. I, I think what is really um, risky for all of us to talk about tech issues is to make assumptions and realize that we're, we're not including everybody in, in the picture that we're painting. Well said. And again, welcome to the Geotech Center. We're glad you're on board. Um, would now I'd like to turn to Brad. Brad, real quick, if you could introduce yourself and, and, and share, you know, what is the biggest trend that you're seeing in 2020 regarding democratization of technologies and remote work? Uh, well, David, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a partner at a venture capital firm uh, called Foundry Group that invests all across the U.S. in early stage tech companies, uh, but also invests in early stage venture funds. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of TechStars, uh, which is a global entre uh, global accelerator. Uh, that has built a very large network around the world to help entrepreneurs succeed. Uh, and I'm also author of a number of books around uh, technology, entrepreneurship, startup communities, uh, and sort of phenomena of technology. Um, I, I think that there's a more profound thing going on in 2020 than just the democratization uh, of technology. Um, I, I describe it uh, as though we're in a liminal space right mm -hmm. now. Um, and if people don't know what that means or don't relate to it, uh, if you're in the U.S. right now, um, the election is a, a perfect example of that. Uh, liminal space is uh, the space between what was and what's next. Uh, it's almost always uncomfortable. Uh, it's often a, a transitional threshold. Um, and it is very unpredictable and needs to be processed differently by different people in different ways. Um, the COVID crisis, which, you know, started in the U.S. really in March, wasn't just one crisis. It was multiple crises, uh, obviously a health crisis that generated an economic crisis that's generating a mental health crisis that's amplified a racial equity crisis that's been going on in our country. Uh, since inception. And if you look at the impact of technology from that point forward, uh, it has accelerated dramatically the inequities that we have in our country. 
and uh, a number of those were already touched on, uh, you know, prior between people. And I think Esther described sort of the health dynamic of trying to address sort of everyone uh, in, in, in a foundational way. But uh, it's very, very powerful, uh, the tendency that as uh, humans we have to predict where this is going to go. And my own belief in this moment is that we have accelerated uh, the pace of what was happening already by five years. Mm -hmm. So the last nine months have essentially pushed us forward to 2025. We have not caught up with it yet in terms of how things work and how we're adopting to it and adapting to it. Many of the dynamics uh, which are incumbent resistors to that sort of evolution of our species, our society, uh, that are also impacted by technology, some incumbents have gained enormous power, other incumbents have collapsed. And the disparity between that and the unpredictability of that and the unevenness of that, not just in the US, but globally, um, is I think in this moment still being not well processed or understood, especially since we haven't reached anywhere close to the end state of that transformation. Um, the other part of it, which, you know, there's a lot of easy stuff to talk about, like, you know, uh, dis distributed companies and remote work and sort of the ability for some people to do it and the ability for others not to. And the idea that cities that uh, previously, you know, had high congregation of talent that became very, very expensive. I'm thinking specifically of San Francisco. Uh, that all of a sudden has the ability for many of those people to work wherever they want because they have the financial resources, because their companies have the uh, functional infrastructure, because they have the cultural norms. Sort of the, the shift of what that means over the next couple of years in terms of the uh, disbursement of that, those people and talent, even if they continue to work for those companies for a period of time, I think is just not well processed in terms of how physical places are going to absorb that, not just in the US, but all over the place. So I, I think it's, a, it, you know, Esther said complicated. I've been talking about it as complex and a complex system. <laughs> That's the essence of the book that I wrote, The Startup Communities, is sort of the notion of how startup communities grow and develop as complex systems and using complexity theory to inform it. I think we're in this midst of this incredible phase shift or phase transformation as a species that lots of people have been talking about and leading up to as futurists, but that we're gonna be in this extraordinarily uncomfortable position for a period of time as many of these things sort out in ways that are non-deterministic. You can't say, and this is now what's going to happen here. Um, but instead, we're, what we do in the moment has a big impact on then what happens next. Very well said. And I, I, you know, one of the things we've been trying to emphasize with the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center is the choices we make in the next few weeks, few months, will have reverberations for at least five to 10 years from now. And then I think you're absolutely right that uh, what we may need are not futurists, but instead people that can help us uh, recognize that that we, like you said, have jumped five years ahead. We will probably jump another five years ahead if this continues for another year or more. And how do we have the ability to catch up almost like jet lag so our body now gets used to the new time zone that we are currently occupying? So so that's, that's very well said, Brad. And that leads now to a question I have for Esther, which is, uh, given what Brad just shared, uh, what does this mean for communities and organizations? Um, how, how do they operate now? Or how can how should how should we think about the future of communities and organizations given everything we've been talking about? Oh, and you're muted. Sorry. As Brad says, it's a complex and complicated system, and I mean, in the end, the answer is going to be so different for depending on so many. You know, this is not a two or three dimensional spectrum. It's it's multivariate, millions of vectors, whatever. But you know, there, there are certain things that are really interesting to watch. And one is in, in a lot of communities, you now have more people. And this is now, we're talking about communities of people, geographic as opposed to 
organizations and stuff like that, which maybe I'll get to later, or maybe I'll talk too much on the first one. But what you're finding is it's now easier for community members to engage. It used to be like, I've got the kids and I'm supposed to go to the city council meeting. I have no childcare. <laughs> uh, and so in some ways you actually get more engagement on issues that community members care about. That is obviously only if the city council bothers to invite them and, and actually would like their attention. But what we're finding is that it's, it, th there are a lot of benefits, especially for example, in Muskegon, Michigan, you know, nobody wants to go outdoors after November. Right. And you know, now even with COVID, you can still go to the council meeting and make your voice heard. Uh, that of course assumes you at least have some minimal access to the technology, but the, the dynamics, the importance of geography changes. It doesn't vanish, but it definitely changes. Um, it, overall communities and companies are getting way, way more efficient. On the other hand, there's this trade off to efficiency, which is the, the dynamics of the human relationships that foster the creativity, the serendipity, the, you know, if you go to lunch with a colleague, is that wasted time? Hmm. Or does it mean that suddenly the person in product sparks an idea in the mind of the person in engineering that would not have happened if they weren't in the cafeteria together? And the, the dynamics of that and the trade-offs there are going to be very different per company, per kind of group. Uh, Google apparently found that as engineers weren't feeling as productive, it's very different working with a team that's existed for five years remotely versus trying to join a team as a new employee. And I'm sure all of you have friends who've been trying to do that and it's, it can be quite challenging. You know, how, do you, how do you absorb a company culture? Um, and it's worth noting that sometimes friction free isn't good. You know, a little friction in terms of, is this really a good decision? Uh, did everybody really get a chance to buy in? So it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I, I see, so I was on crutches a month ago. I went to visit my community in Muskegon and it's amazing if you show up on crutches, you've taken a COVID test, uh, there's this thing in everybody's mind of, you know, I owe her one, whether it's, I got to give a good report on my project or I need to pay attention to what she's saying. I mean, every good salesman knows how important it is to show up at the client's doorstep and make them feel that implicit obligation. So how you, how you replace some of these dynamics, how you, account for their lack, how you, you know, get rid of some of them that really are wasteful. I mean, there's, there's a lot of travel that really should never have happened. Right. And a lot of travel expenses that, you know, when we take them out of the GMP, they reduce people's, they reduce employment income, but they didn't necessarily create a lot of value beyond that. Uh, I really like what you're saying there, Esther, about one, notions of geography tied to community may be shifting so it's now the community that we choose to create that may not necessarily be defined by geography but then you're also talking about uh notions of travel changing notions of interactions real quick if i could ask you one quick rejoinder before i go to dairy um do you see there possibly being tensions where people may identify with groups that transcend geography but the very geography they occupy in they may not identify with Yes. And I mean, there's a, there's a big challenge of, you know, again, some people can transcend geography and some can't. Right. So, you know, if, if the rich kids in school can go to remote school and for whatever reason, the poor kids can't, you, you exacerbate that internal division. Uh, the people who are stuck local, you know, the great thing about an online community is if it becomes terrible, everybody can leave. Yeah, you know, they just but if the physical community starts 
falling apart, the the lucky ones leave and the rest are left behind. And honestly, that's what we've seen happen in so many physical communities all around the U.S. and and the world. And you know, and that's that's not solved by getting giving them technology because that just means yet another layer of people can leave. But you still leave the ones that are really stuck get more stuck. So again, you exacerbate that divide. Right. Very well said. And, and I think, it, it, you know, we, we, we used to talk about upwards mobility. What we may need to start about is additional dimensions to mobility. So, so Derry, I'm going to turn to you and, and, and maybe I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know in the past you've done some work that's done some interesting tracking of activities in, in cyberspace. You've, you've, you've done some detection of bots. You know, everything that we're talking about here, the good news is more humans can participate remotely, but that also means the bots can too. So maybe you could share us your thoughts uh, if you unmute yourself and, and share what, what are you thinking that's happening in that space. Thanks for the reminder there on the muting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, um, the, 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 on the previous uh, challenges that we discovered on the bots and the, 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 the utilization of bots uh, to disrupt um, communications and to, to facilitate uh, interesting financial transactions, I shall say, um, it, it is, is only going to continue and has only continued. Um, I think in the age of more of us being online, you have more folks you can leverage to, to hide those transactions in and within, in and between. Um, for those who are able to get online, I should say that's great. Um, and the challenge, I think, goes back to this educational piece that needs to be there. And I, I've, I think I've said this uh, earlier, just a little bit on the cybersecurity. But that that is extremely critical because what we what you will see and you will expose yourself to is more um, more of these bots, more susceptibility to the challenges. And what you will find as Esther said, you know, you have the physical community and then you have your virtual community with whom you identify with. So you may be physically in one location, uh, but identify with another, two other communities. Um, what happens if those two other communities become infiltrated by bots unintentionally and unknowingly to you um, because of the lack of physical space uh, by which you would normally meet and potentially identify that this person truly is not a bot? Um, and the bots are becoming smarter because it's not, um, it's not just a single bot situation. There's a human and bot interaction that drives this challenge. So what you have to look out for and start understanding it within your communities is the recognition as to what is it truly, who are you truly interacting with and are, did one, two, are you well informed enough to truly understand and detect um, the challenges within that community to ensure that you're not susceptible to, you know, potential misinformation or misleading information that's created by a bot, not a human. Um, there's a difference when a human does it, and there's a difference when a bot does it um, intentionally uh, built to, to target an attack. Um, so the democratization of those technologies, as I was mentioning before, now that becomes in the hands of so many others and organizations are thinking about security, but from what I understand, still haven't quite understood or, or implemented that security level to the point where um, they can be assured that those who are leveraging their, their networks are really the persons who should be. Um, so, so there's that. And I think um, back to that educational piece, you know, we definitely have to find ways so that companies and organizations um, do a better job of educa educating the, the newly folks who are online to the dangers of being online. Back in the days when we were in the in the first days of starting up, don't talk to anybody on, strangers online. <laughs> so we we may have to have that conversation again, um, uh, you know, to ensure that we're back where we need to be. Fascinating. And 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 I was thinking about when you were saying, you know, the norm of don't talk to strangers um, or don't get in a car with a stranger. We probably said that about twenty years ago, but now we get in cars with strangers on a regular basis because technology mediates it. So this gets to what you were talking about, Brad, which is it's changing norms, it's changing things that are acceptable, things that are unacceptable. What do, if you, what do you think this means? What would you recommend for entrepreneurs to consider as they look at this, this, these, these significant changes that are happening? Well, I'd, <clears throat> I'd start by asserting that our existing 
technologies that we use around this problem space and whether you want to define the problem space as facilitating community, facilitating uh, interaction that transcends physical space or, you know, put, put your label on it. I, I would start by asserting that the existing technologies that we have today, not just the applications, but also the technology platforms and infrastructure uh, is generally pathetic. Yes, <laughs> and, I agree. <laughs> uh, it's, it's something that, um, you know, as an investor for many years now in uh, internet related companies, as I sit here in, in the, you know, tail end of 2020, uh, I feel um, almost amazed. Like that's the only emotion that I can ponder up amazed is is neutral enough uh, that I can apply it as a very negative emotion, um, but still sort of the magnitude of it with our acceptance as a society for the extraordinary uh, lack of, of uh, efficacy of much of the technologies that we use today. Um, and there's multiple dimensions of this. And I think these are the opportunities for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, let's start with uh, the fundamental dynamics of many of our very, very popular consumer social networking type applications and, and just acknowledge that they are fundamentally uh, manipulation machines. Mm -hmm. And they are manipulation machines no different than the manipulation machines that the advertising industry foisted upon us in the 1950s that you can watch and enjoy in Mad Men. Um, but at much, much, much broader scale and much higher fidelity. And the economic characteristics of that creates a feedback loop for those companies that makes it impossible, almost, I shouldn't say impossible, almost impossible for them to do anything in spite of themselves other than perpetuate that phenomena. In 2020, when all of a sudden we rush towards this notion of embracing onlineness um, in different dimensions, uh, interestingly, if you look at the consumer side space and then compare that to the enterprise or business space and compare that to uh, K through 12 or college space, and you think about the software infrastructures for those various communities, well, obviously it's amazing that we can globally do video conferencing at scale kind of without missing a beat. If you think about how that technology interfaces with all of your other workflows on a daily basis, it's pretty horrible. If you think about it from the perspective of, you know, your, your uh, teenage child, who is smart enough to figure out how to manipulate that technology so that they don't actually have to really engage with school. Or as my very smart and accomplished niece likes to say, oh yeah, I'm done with school at 11 in the morning. Huh. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, and, and then like, okay, now what? Um, there's, there's such a breadth of opportunity, both in terms of just functional uh, engagement, integration between these things uh, in a way that gets us to really using this technology in a way where it starts to disappear, where what we're doing today is we're still having to deal with this technology front and center, and then acknowledging that an enormous percentage of our time spent engaging with this technology is really just reinforcing our own uh, manipulation as individuals and as a species um, towards outcomes that we don't necessarily have agency over through the way we're engaging with the technology. These are, again, all things when I talk about us being in this sort of phase shift, um, you know, the law, very famously, the law lags technology. And so the problems that the law is working on today, to the extent that there's any functional engagement in our country around this kind of stuff, it's dealing with five-year-old problems. It's not dealing with the problems in front of us. 
and again, another opportunity for entrepreneurs is to anticipate where that's going to be and get in front of the phase transformation with what they're creating and inventing, but do it in a way that does not, um, uh, I would say, build off of or simply amplify or reinforce uh, a commercial motion that has little to no value for society. Um, it's reflective. I know I've, I've reflected on Esther a few times. Maybe that's just because I have so much uh, uh, respect for what she says and what I learned from her. Um, this notion that we've had an enormous amount of travel that did not, while it, while it increased GDP, it did not add anything to our society as a species. And so it was basically the equivalent of empty calories. Mm -hmm. Um, or it might have been the equivalent of eating lots of sugar, wasn't healthy for you. And we have a ton of this going on in our everyday lives. And it's so hard once you start eating the ton of sugar to stop eating the sugar, because the sugar makes you want to eat more sugar. And, and we're in a place again, this liminal state where there's an opportunity, I think, for some people to start to recognize and change from an entrepreneurial and a technological perspective, uh, that vector, um, but recognizing that it's pretty, it's it's transformative and pretty foundational. Excellent. So, so we now are about uh, twenty minutes remaining. So, I'm going to ask the panelists. That we're going to shift a little bit to almost a quasi lightning round, where we're going to go to more sort of like short one minute answers, if possible. And and Brad, you sort of opened up the door to thinking about you know that this is changing how we think about. How do we get ahead of things involving the law? Because like you said, the law, when you said it, they're dealing with five-year-old issues, I didn't know if you meant they're five years old in age or if it's equivalent to, I have a three-year-old right now, whether or not they're doing, they're, they're acting like five-year-olds. But we won't go there. there. <laughs> but, but you're talking about governance. We're talking about rethinking education. So I'm going to go first to Chris and, and let me know if this is a hot potato for you. If entrepreneurs want to help build a better future, could you give me a short, maybe one minute or so answer as to where could they actually sort of, instead of just investing to create value, but investing to create a future that is better, where would you have them think about either better doing governance, better doing education? Uh, real quick, Chris, do you have some thoughts on that? I do. I don't have to convince them at all they're doing it. I mean, that to me is, that, that's not where we need to put our emphasis. I mean, the blessing of my life and Brad's life is that there are young people everywhere unencumbered by the legacy that Brad described, yet encumbered by some of the legacy rules of regulation that are upon, who are getting up in the morning, go to bed at night and saying, how is it possible that so many people are in classrooms of 70 kids and they can't get around it? How is it possible that 70% of my country has no access to a bank account and can't move money except physically or borrow money at 1% a day interest? And they're going step by step through these things with a deep idea that they're creating economic value, but at the same time, that's not really why they're doing it. They believe almost interspersed that they are doing something that is profound uh, for their society and the community writ large. They're not the issue. To me, the issue is the folks that Brad was kind of alluding to at all. And let me just say you know, in a 13 more seconds right now, the, the great takeaway of this conversation is in the work that you're doing, David, because I think policymakers need to step up I mean, for too long, everything that we've been talked about here has been viewed as a cute sideshow to other political policy or economic priorities or something maybe to even criticize overall. Nothing we have discussed today, not one thing of what we discussed today came up in our election debates really at all. So step one, I think, is to prioritize this clear reality that folks here are describing so beautifully and to create an agenda for our country and how we engage a broad strategy to unleash the very people that you were asking about to begin with. Excellent. And very well said, Chris. And, and it's interesting, yes, because we, we watched what was happening with, with somewhat dismay that there weren't these deep conversations about what are the choices we want to use data and tech for. And they need to happen. They need to happen not just at a national level. We need to have it at a global level um, because Absolutely. if we if we if we don't have these conversations, then as Brad was saying earlier, the choices we make over the next weeks and months will have outsized influence over the next five to 10 to 15 years ahead. Um, so now I'm going to now turn to Stephanie and say, recognizing you're on day 10 with the Geotech Center, but, but if, you, if you had to think about what would be things you'd want to tackle using these data and technologies uh, uh, to, to actually work to building a better future involving the planet or the global food system, if you could in one minute give me your thoughts, that would be great. 
Sure, so I'm going to answer your question with one specific example of work we're doing here. But first, I want to say, I think what jumped out to me today was Brad's comment about this idea that technology is both accelerating and that we're also taking heavy losses at the same time. And so I think that's going to result in some really interesting convergences. So I think it's important that we start doing deeper dives and having more granular conversations. And so I'm really excited for that reason about our Agritech Action Conference coming up November 17th through 19th, where we're going to really get an opportunity to unpack that in the agritech sector and looking at agriculture, food supply, supply chain, all of those really important issues. And I think when we're talking about the mission of, of geotech and you know, advancing peace and prosperity, you can't do it without really addressing these fundamental building blocks of food, water, energy access. So I think this will be a really exciting venue for us to see just how is technology accelerating it and what areas aren't we, you know, aren't we getting to or need more support. Excellent, and, 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 and yes, uh, thanks for bringing up the Agritech Action. I believe everyone on this uh, Geotech Hour just volunteered to be a part of it. We will be following up with you. Um, because yes, it seems to be we can rethink how we do agriculture, we can rethink how we do the global food system so we don't have about one seventh or one eighth of the planet going hungry. We don't have to wait 10 years, which is currently the UN goal to make sure everyone who wants food can get food. We can solve this in the next year or less if we think about this smartly. Um, so thank you for emphasizing that, Stephanie. I do want to call out, um, we, we've been talking a little bit about first that, you know, there, there are two Gibson quotes, William Gibson quotes that come to mind, which is the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. But also there is a different quote that he has about jet lag is your soul trying to catch up with you. Uh, Brad, to your point, uh, our souls are so far behind what's really happened that we need to figure out a way to accelerate. Um, and, and I wouldn't call that futurist, I would call that, jet lag accelerators or jet lag diminishers or whatever it might be. So, so that's, a, that's a good analogy to think about. So with that, Derry, uh, I know that you've been seeing a lot in this space as well. What would you want to emphasize as action that could be taken maybe either at the state level, county level, national level, uh, in one minute or so uh, to, to, to make sure we actually are putting forth action and not just uh, pontification about these changes? Um. That's a that's a heck of a question in one minute. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it starts with the local side of things and getting your local um, the the local for more of an encouragement and, and helping the educational perspective, helping to increase access at local levels and really truly understanding the local challenges because the challenges in, for example, uh, Virginia Beach as compared to Washington D.C. as compared to a very small town in um, you know, in rural America are going to be completely different. Right. And, um, I just, I guess, tip my hat to, I'm in the East coast here. <laughs> um, but you know, one of the challenges that I think we're going to continue to face is we've got to have that involvement from a local level without that local challenge, without those local folks getting involved, we're going to be at a huge disadvantage. If we look only at a national solution to this problem, we're going to mess up everyone's life, right? And, and that's not the only way to do it. It has to be informed locally. So you have to get your um, your, your your local uh, uh, economies working and, and have the local folks from that side involved from not just from a co corporate, not just the local economies from the government side, but co companies as well working together to understand and truly get the needs of that community and being able to come together and bridging that divide. Excellent. Thank you, Derry. And, and, and so I'm going to circle back to you, Chris, and, and say, you know, is this a case where we need to lock the policymakers in a room with entrepreneurs so they get informed? Do we shove a pizza box under the door? Or do we need to possibly actually identify at a community level important issues that need to be solved? And instead of waiting for possibly governments to solve them, maybe we need to figure out a way to actually have entrepreneurs working with policymakers to actually demonstrate a better way forward. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, Chris, and about, again, unfortunately, we're pressed for time. So No, I, I suspect it's a little bit of, of all those elements with a caveat, which is I think that we're not in the evangelism business, meaning this is not a business of trying to convert a bunch of people who really do not understand this or who's in, you know, Washington and most governments are a city of incentives. Right. And there are people of incentives not to engage. And I think the key is, particularly with some remarkable new generation people throughout public policy, is to be able to have a kind of a dialogue and a shared experience <clears throat> where we're not trying to convert anybody to understand what to us in this panel is common sense, but to figure out concrete ways how we can support it. And by the way, supporting it can be stepping back and laying things on leash or to open up regulatory aspects of it. But other cases are going to be things quite proactive 
And ironically, to my, my point earlier, some of these lessons aren't here. Some of these lessons are in Singapore. Some of these lessons are in Dubai. Some of these lessons are in Estonia. And some of them are in places that may be having lots of other problems, but realize at the end of the day that if they don't get financial inclusion right, they're going to suffer terribly, therefore being innovative. So we have to be open to those patterns, starting by, I think, getting together a kind of amazing group of the willing to want to make this a priority and to actually have applicable action that comes from it. Very well said, and, and that, that I agree with you 100%. We need to recognize no one has a monopoly on the answers here, and as you said, um, Singapore, uh, we're seeing fascinating things happening with the UAE and Israel now that they are friends, also India getting involved, and so there's a lot of interesting things that can come to bear here as we think about this way forward. So, so, so Brad, and then I'm going to go to Esther, and then to Stephanie, um, how might we engage, you know, you know, I knew in the past, if I got off a plane and said, do you want to talk about geopolitics in California? Most people were not too excited. But how do we engage VCs and investors to think about that they have a role to play in, in shaping a world that is, that is better collaborations around the world, is better communities, even if we don't use the geopolitical world? Brad? Yeah, it's, it's a very vexing question to me. Um, uh, I think that uh, you know, Chris said something important, which is that, uh, and I'll generalize it, which is that, that politics in my mind is really a collision of incentives. And, you know, people, people operate uh, from a perspective of what their incentives are rather than from an abstract perspective. And, you know, orthogonal to that often is the entrepreneur or investors perspective on trying to create something that changes the way existing things work. Um, neither of these are fundamentally problematic. Uh, they are just parallel universes. And uh, we see it play out, especially around incentives, because as power accrues uh, to companies, especially you know, in the governance model that we have in the United States right now, um, it becomes increasingly difficult, you know, to quote, regulate those companies. Um, and so the idea of uh, using uh, uh, politics, uh, sort of interesting people uh, in politics for the sake of it, sort of intellectual pursuit uh, from the sort of technology perspective is it, kind of counterproductive because in a lot of cases it comes back to those incentives because even if you could do that on the political side it's usually a combination of a very short term game with a very long term game that's completely disconnected from the time frame and the way that technologists entrepreneurs and investors think about things so my sense is historically there have been a nucleus of people who cross over between the two that are interested in both not just technologists that cross over to public policy, but people from the public policy perspective who become interested in technology. Um, and so I say it's vexing because I think from where I sit, I see the separation being more distinct. I see way more uh, people that are very wealthy in technology approaching politics from a perspective of playing the same influence and incentive game to try to get outcomes that they're interested in. Uh, and outcomes that fit their frame of reference versus the more abstract approach to what's better for, you know, society or civilization. Um, I'll, I'll just sort of end this rant with, you know, since the beginning of time, as far as I can tell, as, as somebody who reads a lot of both history and probably even more science fiction, because I find science fiction to be really stimulating about where we could go, on that spectrum, uh, from, from inception, uh, human beings have been killing their neighbors to try to take over their neighbor's land. And I use that as sort of a very coarse grade metaphor for how so much of this works uh, within the political infrastructure where people view it as a zero sum game and they view it as a I win, you lose. And it's you know, never more front and center to somebody who's not in the middle of it than today. And I would just encourage people who are interested in the intersection between public policy and technology to view it as a positive sum game for society and for humanity rather than a zero sum game for uh, interest A versus interest B, which unfortunately is how it feels from where I sit, much of the energy is focused. 
Very well said, and and I agree with you 100% that uh, I've often defined civilization is when you don't automatically kill the newcomer or the new idea, Um, but the question is, are we losing civilization? So we've only got about five minutes left, so we're going to shift now to the lightning round. I'm going to go first to you, Esther, um, both on your thoughts about investors, but what would be one or two tweet length answers about if we wanted to change the game and play the game differently? Because I think that's what we're talking about here. What would you recommend? Here's a couple of really concrete though electronic thoughts sure first um, we need to give people the knowledge and the tech that's intelligible to manipulate themselves rather than to be manipulated and you know we we're beginning to understand maybe you can do that people can give themselves diet advice using an app Uh, can they give themselves long-term thinking using an app can they you know, as they think about politics, can they, can they see the impact of policy and visualize it? Can the app kind of nudge them to think about their grandchildren so they think long term? Can the app help them understand that it's not just about their rich white friends, but also all the other people in the community? Can they see the impact of poor people getting sick on the taxes they're going to pay in the future? So we, we need that ability to visualize and for people to manipulate themselves rather than be manipulated. Uh, We need something, so it's really interesting, the insurance companies, and that is about the oldest, most boring business, but the best insurance companies and the best insurance doesn't simply spread risk and take a premium off the top. It reduces risk. It, you know, has people inspect for oily rags. It have, have you do a cybersecurity audit before they'll give you insurance. Um, I'm an investor in a company called Go that monitors your driving with your permission. Hmm. And then if you drive safely, gives you lower insurance rates. And that means people actually drive more safely. It's not just that their insurance premiums are better assigned, but they behave better. And so this whole notion of using counterfactuals, uh, if I'm an insurance company, I spend a billion dollars on a population of 10 million doing diabetes prevention, how can I prove that they actually are healthier and cost me less? How do I start thinking about that long-term? And that's where we need to, I think, you know, bring in large institutions that think long-term that get paid collectively by society for cutting what ultimately amounts to a tax burden as well as a productivity and a human happiness burden on all of us. Excellent. Uh, And I particularly like how you talked about rethinking how we can use existing things like insurance to actually drive the change we want. Again, it gets to Brad's comment about the incentives. These are things people are used to. One of the things we've talked about at Geotech Center, do we need to have certified public accountants, but for other things such as for data or things like that, where they take an oath and they're following the flows of data and technology. Uh, all right, so now, uh, Derry, 30 seconds or less, what would be one thing you would have governments do differently to help usher in this new era? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I, I would say really trying to work more with the local corporations, the local um, the, the, the local communities in, involved, right? And getting directly involved in that public-private partnership and not just trying to push policy alone because policy alone um, is going to be uninformed and delivered and implemented in not the ways that and have unintended consequences, negative consequences. So working with the local organizations, and I guarantee you there's a ton, including us, Geotech Center, <laughs> um, to, to help inform some of those uh, decisions that they'll be making. Excellent. Uh, Stephanie, same question, and then I'm going to go to Chris to wrap it up and bring it home for us. What would you have one thing governments do differently in terms of how they engage new technologies and data to produce a better future? Um, Probably a little bit of a trite answer, but I'd say work together. I I think we've got to be coming together to address these technology challenges and find paths forward that represent all of our interests. Excellent. The emphasis on participation, I know we've all been saying here, we need to involve people. We need to involve the public. Chris, bring it home for us. What would be one thing you would have be done differently? It's kind of what I ended before, and it's a reflection of this truly astounding panel. I I just learned so much for you, and that is we have an opportunity, unprecedented, to step up. And step one is to prioritize the clear reality we have described and create this agenda at home and locally and how we uh, engage abroad in doing so. And I will say to 
what she just said a moment ago, and this is maybe counter to the feelings of this election, which we've avoided all day, but there is no mandate right now. And in that there is a, in fact, an opportunity. There's an opportunity in the result that just happened for people to reach out in unobvious ways to unobvious communities to have different kinds of discussions. And I hope that we look at it that way and we find that kind of opportunity. Very well said. And actually, I love your optimism, which is exactly that, which is in the absence of anyone giving a mandate, then we should seize that momentum and say, let's make it happen. And I think I look forward to making it happen with all of you. Thank you for probably what was one of the most nuanced geotech hours I think we've ever had so far. Uh, we will definitely have to unpack this and follow up. One for everybody, Agritech Action is November 17th, 18th, and 19th. We'll make sure to share the uh, link in the video and share it with all of you. And we hope to have all the panelists there. And then two, there is the Geotech Commission, which will be releasing its results, we hope, uh, if everything goes well in sometime in December. But we would like to involve everybody here, everyone that put comments in the chats and on social media nice. to inform that commission. Because as we said here, in the absence of anyone trying to put forward the way to make this happen, let's be the Calvary. Let's make it happen. Thanks again to all our panelists. Thanks for all the positive change that you bring and look forward